All right, Michael, I appreciate you doing this, buddy. Yeah, my pleasure. You're here. I've been uh, looking forward to doing this. Really? Yeah, I was looking at your stuff online. That's That's insanity, huh? Yeah. (laughs) I think it's a cool thing. It's a good thing. Well, right off the bat, I heard you speak in an interview, and I think it was like seven years ago. I think it was done for either KDKA or something, and you mentioned, you said the phrase, like you, you see in color or you're very color oriented. Is that right? Well, I. What know, does that mean exactly <laughs> to a non-artist? What does that yeah, mean? Yeah, it. So it's like my story as an artist, I think, is uh, pretty interesting because I didn't start out to be an artist. You know, I, I, I have to tell a story to like explain that. Okay, we're gonna get there for sure. Let's do it <laughs> okay. now. Let's do it now. You know, so how I, did you get into art or make the decision? Yeah, yeah. So like when I was a kid. Like people remember me like in elementary school. I was always drawing. I was always drawing, you know. And I was this creative kid building robots and stuff like uh, building that. Building robots, yeah. Okay, like, you know, at home or okay, trying to. And uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't really think I was uh, anything uh, more creative than other people. But I think I was, you know. But it wasn't. I went to college. I went to Penn State, and I, I was unhappy in the major I was in. It it, it just wasn't for me, and. I, I did a lot of soul searching, and I was actually on academic probation one semester. Okay, so I really had to make a make a move one way or the other. It's a other. great club, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, it's true. You know, we had a lot of fun in that club, didn't we? Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I was floundering around, you know, just never going to class and screwing around all day in my dorm, Snyder Hall. Got to say the dorm. Okay, so. No, I, and I had some real good friends. I had this one friend in particular. He's like, you're an artist, man. That's what he said to me. And that was before I even got into art. I was, always remember that. He said that because he'd seen you work on these robot, robots? No, I think it was just because he was around me. He was like, uh, just my viewpoint. Got he, it. He was a smart guy. Got it. His, uh, his name was Chappie, actually. I got to give him credit. Absolutely. And I always remember that, right? Yeah, right on. But I, so I was allowed to take these uh, three classes only three to get back into college, basically. Okay. And I had to get A's in them, right? So I took these beginning level art classes because I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to go in this direction. And uh, I took this one class, beginning oil painting, with a New York City artist. His name was John Bowman. Okay. He's actually retiring this semester. All so right. So I got to give, give him props for that. But he lived in New York, and he, he commuted between State College and uh, Manhattan. He lived in Brooklyn, okay? But I took this class, and like it, it was like lightning hit. And I, I didn't even know what I was doing. I was just doing it. It was just coming out of me, these this, this art, this canvases. And it really, it was like a movie. Like, I was a nobody. I was a walk-on to the art program, and professors, other professors were coming to look at my stuff. You know, and he took me aside after class. He's like, you really got something. And it went from there. Like I was like so, I was like Picasso. Who's I, I was like this is amazing. I was like so into it, running to the library to get books on Picasso. That's how it all started, right? Okay. And <laughs> so the next semester, I took another uh, art class with a professor who was. They were putting him out to pasture. You know, he didn't care anymore. He's going to retire. He was just riding out his time. It was a, a drawing class, some okay. type of drawing. This, he said the same exact thing after class one day. He's like, you really got something. He, and I was, he's like, I wouldn't say it unless I meant it. You know, he's kind of like, he he had seen it all. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't suffering any fools, okay? <laughs> and I was like, wow, you know, this is it. It was like lightning hit out of nowhere. And I, it just all went from there. But for years, I didn't understand. I didn't understand, like, my talent, so to speak, like I like people are like you're talented. I didn't get what like I didn't understand it. Like what I was doing, and it took it just took a lot of years to figure that out. Like the process mm-hmm. of what I was doing, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I think I've spent enough time around the art community to kind of understand that. Without being an artist, I probably won't fully understand it. But it, the the difficult time thing for, with art with me is, especially visual arts, is there's. I think over time, there's been efforts to label it, right? Like the impressionist and, you know, the, there's labels, yeah. I guess. How, is there a label for your style? Yeah, so... Theoretically? I label it spiritually symbolic. That's what I've labeled it. People label it like... It's not abstract. People say, that's abstract. Not abstract. 
So it's expressionist. It could be labeled expressionist. It could be labeled fauvist, I guess. But I'm finding symbolism okay. in a person. So I, that's what I label it, spiritually symbolic. Like I don't know anyone that does what I do. So let's talk sense. about that because I, yeah, a little unclear. When you say you've, so if you're looking someone, if you're looking at me, yeah, are you saying that you're seeing color, mm-hmm. or you're seeing shapes, you're seeing how does that tra- yeah. how does that translate yeah. from what you absorb to get on to pe- on the canvas? No, it's a it's a very valid question. It's a great question. Uh, yeah, so like. It's the process when I so when I do a portrait, I interview the person, I get like five to ten photos of them, and it's a process of discovery, okay. And like I have, I have the hardest time uh, putting putting this into words. And I, I actually on the back of that book I gave you, mm-hmm. I I've, I've kind of summarized it, right. and I found it in an art history textbook. I don't know where I'm going till I get there. It's like a process of of, of like finding and seeking. It's like sculpting. It's like Michelangelo said when he sculpted, the sculpture was already in there in the marble. The paint, like it, the painting, he was like, revealing it. Maybe? I was revealing it. Okay, he's he said he was revealing it. Okay, right? that's kind of how I look at painting. It's like sculpting. It's like I feel like I'm more of a sculptor, sculptor than a painter, is I'm revealing what's in there, but I don't know what it is till I get there. It's part of the process. Like I'll start out, I have no idea where I'm going. I refer to the interviews. It's like putting a puzzle together, and it just comes as I do the process. It's hard for people to wrap their head around that, but a lot of like creative people, I get it. Get like writers, well, and- musicians. I, th- I some of the the some of the guitarists that I've known over the years that play jazz. The imp- they call them the improvisationists, I guess. Improvisationists. Improvisationist, I can't pronounce it correctly. Those who do a lot of uh, jazz soloing and so forth, they don't know when they start where they're going to end up. Right. But it seems exactly. to work, right? That's exactly <laughs> it. Right. Yes. It's similar to, to jazz in a lot of ways. Yeah. It's it's improv- improvisational. There it is. It's in, That's it's, the word I'm searching for. <laughs> <laughs> it's intuitive. It's um, a lot of it's It's spiritual. Uh, yeah. And so... I, I wish I, th- that book I gave you. Do you yeah. still have it? Yes, yeah, sure do. Like the, the read the back of that. I don't know if you could. Those statements that summarize it. That's the best I ever found. Any summarization of it. This is my search. The making of a work of art has little in common with what we ordinarily mean as making. Hmm. So you're saying that initially we're. Can, read, read the whole thing. Yeah, let's do that because I'm a little bit confused myself. Hold on. I want to know, though. That's the thing. So let me get this up oh, where it sounds okay. All right. So it is a strange and risky business in which the maker never quite knows what they are making until they have actually made it. Or to put it another way, it's a game of find and seek in which the seeker is not sure what they are looking for until they've actually found it. We speak of it as a gift, implying that it is sort of a present from some higher power. To the non-artists, it seems hard to believe that this uncertainty, this need to take a chance, should be the essence of the artist's work. The urge to penetrate unknown realms to achieve something original may be felt by everyone, every one of us now and then. We'll go back to that. What sets the real artist apart is not so much the desire to seek, but the mysterious ability to find, which we call talent. Huh. There's a lot in there, pal. <laughs> So you're saying that this is the best, this is your very best attempt to describe the process on how you create. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's the best I ever found. <laughs> like, yes. I, I, it's funny because I can see from my world, which I'm not an accomplished musician. I just touch on the outer edge of that whole thing, but I can see how a lot of this is applicable to a musician. And I know guitar is a guitar virtuosos who really explore and express through the instrument where they start but they don't know where they're going to finish 
Yes, yes, yes. But it, but but applying it to canvas or to sculpture to, or something, and that's that's a whole other ball game. Which we, you know, the average person or even a musician may have a hard time understanding that. Yeah, where it comes from. Yes, absolutely. Right? Yes, yes. Like I didn't understand it for years. <laughs> I didn't get it. I was just doing it. I wasn't doing it as well as I think I'm doing it now because I feel like I understand it, the process now. But Is it more about understanding yourself maybe or is it more about – is a combination of maybe that and the process? Um, I, I think it's um, – yeah, maybe it's a little bit myself, but I uh, I just feel like I understand uh, the, the process of doing the art. Like – just and it it's summarized there like i when i read that i was like that's it that's exactly it i could never put it into my own words mm-hmm. that was that in a there's in art history there's a t- hand uh jansen is mm-hmm. a famous art historian all the textbooks that comes from his book it was an old jan- and i read that you know the library resonated with you oh yeah the librarian was thrown away the art history textbook it was so old and i i was like you want this? I I read. It. I'm like, wow, that's it. It's like falling apart in my hands. But so I took it from there. When you started to paint, was it through the encouragement initially of everybody telling you should be doing this, right? Yeah, yeah. At what point in that process? How long did it take before you really felt like this is what I should be doing? Or or yeah, that's that's really good. Uh, well, like I. I knew like it was such a like uh, powerful thing at Penn State, like the experience with the professors. I mean, these were real New York City artists and accomplished people telling me that I should be. That took me a long t- way, but I didn't get it. Like I said, I I kept like hanging on to that for years out of college. Like, yeah, I should be doing this. I'm doing this, but I didn't get get it fully. But I kept going because of those like uh, those incent those uh, uh, encouragements like mm-hmm. they were so powerful. They mm-hmm. took me here like they took me a long way, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, it just came to a point like I didn't. I kind of ran out at a point, and I uh, I kind of hit a wall, and uh, I, I. But somehow I kept going. I kept kept going, uh, and then like I just. I start doing the portraits mainly, and that's when I kind of was like tapped into that, that discovery and finding the symbolism. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, like I was carried out of college with this encouragement. Like I must, something must be going on here. I should probably be doing this. All these signs and people tell, you know. But in my deep down, I didn't really get it. <laughs> okay. I didn't really get it, but then just I kept going. I kept going, and uh. I, I feel like I, I found I found it. How, yeah. How long before you recognized you had your own style? Uh, probably like you know I knew I knew what I was doing. It was it was just coming out of me. But I don't. That, that's a good question. Probably not for. Uh, let's see. Uh, probably like ten years. It took about ten years. Wow. 11 years to really find my ident- niche for you to identify your own style mm-hmm. then. wow yeah. that's, that's maybe 12 years i would not have expected you to say that i would think yeah. it would have been identifiable to the artist sooner than that well like this the early stuff i did you can tell it's mine uh like i have an early portrait i did and i just showed it i show it when i do show lo- i still have it people are like oh they, they really like it but it was like just the start of it. It was the tip of the iceberg, <laughs> you know? Like you can tell it's mine, but it's not full blossomed where I should be as an artist. You know, it's not it's not fully actualized. I've asked artists that have been on the podcast, how do they know when it's done? Yeah, that's a great question. It's, in. I just know it's intuitive. Like it, like each portrait I do takes about four months, right? Wow. Okay. And I just there comes a point where I can feel it's getting close, and then uh, I just know it's done. <laughs> like I just know it's done. You know, there's no it can't take it any further. This is done. She's no inside. Yeah. 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 You just know. <laughs> I asked um, I asked Mia Tarducci that on the podcast. How do you know it's done? She goes, I know it's done when I think she said when I feel that if I apply one more 
piece of paint to that canvas, it'll make me sick. <laughs> you know, because I because it's just too much. It, yeah, that little extra. I, I just know at that moment that it bothers me that yeah. deeply, and I'm like, you know, it's pretty heady. You know, but I get, but I get it though. So there's something inside that's telling you it's done. Yeah, yeah. Like it for me, the the whole process is is intuitive and it's spiritual. Like so, I, back to that. When you say it's spiritual, um, when people hear that word, some people think religion. Some people yeah. think Zen. Some people think uh, yeah. You know, and, and you have your people that believe out it's all bullshit so when you say spiritual what do you mean yeah. it's just an emotion that comes forth uh, that's a that's a very good question and that's a loaded word uh uh to me like what i do is a calling okay mm-hmm. it's a calling and it, it comes from uh it comes from a higher realm like it's not <laughs> you know and i didn't understand that when i started believe me but it's uh I think a lot of art comes from a higher realm, you know, and, and it's it's a spiritual practice, if if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, for me, like going to the studio doing this, it's a spiritual practice. Okay. You know? Like, you know, some people go to church every Sunday and that's their spiritual practice or they, mm-hmm. they, they pray every day or they meditate. And mm-hmm. uh, for me... Uh, having a calling as a spiritual practice and this is a calling to me so Uh if that makes sense yeah for sure for sure yeah Yeah. that's to get to that point that's some requires some deep thinking am i right i mean you know did was it did you feel that way about art immediately or did you reflect on that over time and like this is a calling for me no, that's another great question. No, I did not feel that immediately at all. Like I, but it was so, uh, <laughs> like it really, it was like, like, you know, I was saying I was a walk on to the program. I, I was not an art student accepted in the program. And it was such a, uh, like powerful, uh, response I got. Like that was a sign to me. I mean, that, that w- wasn't normal. It yeah. was like, you know. So, so was it other people's was it reaffirmation from others? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, you know, like I said, these real artists, these professors. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. That was the start of it. Yeah. Color. Talk to me about color and what it means to you or what and what it doesn't mean to you. Mm. Well, I think Cuz you're very your your work is very vibrant. Yeah. Which I love cuz I like bright colors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look around. Yeah. yeah. That's good. They have a great studio. I love it. Thank you, buddy. Um, you should. People should pay just to come see this. This is a work of art. Is I'm there money it, in that? I I'm could to itself. <laughs> I could tell this some is people. <laughs> amazing space you have here. It really is. People uh, have reactions. They're not always great, it. but they have reactions. I like it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but uh, color, color is... Color is like very fascinating. Like there's so many uh, meanings and value to color in and of itself. I don't think most people ever think about it, but I, I think about color a lot, and I'm yeah. constantly perplexed because really? yeah. Yeah, because it's one th- it's one of the things in our realm. Correct me if I'm wrong that we can't describe. Yeah. You can describe it, but you cannot articulately explain to someone what blue looks like, what orange looks like. In words, anyway. Yeah, yeah. If they didn't, if they'd never yeah. seen orange before, can you actually describe it in a way that they would know what that color looked like? Yeah, I was just uh, talking to my uh, dad about that. You can, I mean, just the, the experience of a person being blind, and yeah, can you do? I, that's a great question. Can you really give someone what it, uh, orange or purple is, or what it quote unquote feels like? You, know? you can get closer, I think, on the feel end, but, yeah. so they can maybe try to visualize, and hopefully, it gets there. But yeah. how do you really articulate it? Right, but it, the, there's values in every culture to color. I mean, I mean, most people know that, you know, and it's uh, it's often the opposite. And like, you know, in China, white is a color of mourning, I believe, the total opposite than what it is here. Or red has completely different connotations, which I find so interesting. But it's pretty universal, like color and 
I just I just find it really interesting and like teaching as a teacher, teaching students about color or just letting them do color on their own and what comes out of them. It's like it's like a just a natural expression. Mm-hmm. But yeah, color is fascinating if you think about it. Yeah. There's a guitar player, uh, a jazz player who's no longer with us. Pretty legendary in guitar circles, but but very a uh, small niche. His name was Alan Holdsworth, and when he would do interviews, he would actually say, you know. Music is a mathematic to me. It's mathematical to most people. You know, you can break it down mathematically with yeah. notes and so forth and timing. But he would say that he he saw everything in colors, and it was so far out there. We would read these articles as you know, guitar magazines yeah. as a kid, going, "What the hell is he talking about?" But to him, it made sense. Obviously, it's working. And I think it's true. It's. I mean, I, I'm not a musician. I love music, but. I just hearing like Paul McCartney interviewed. He Paul McCartney doesn't know how to read music. Mm-hmm. Think about that. The mm-hmm. greatest, one of most, the greatest. I don't think most of them don't. <laughs> think about that. Think about that though. I mean, there you uh-huh. go. Right. A Beatle, right? <laughs> yeah, like one of the greatest musicians of the 20th century doesn't know how to read music, right? Mm-hmm. So there's something more to I think to art than well, learning it on paper. You know, my friend, I couldn't agree more. I think that your point is proven by the fact that most rock and rollers. That learned to play guitar, learned the basic chords, and went out. It was so it was so overwhelming that they had to express this, that they basically bashed their way through to success. And most of them weren't musicians, hmm. you know. So that that's that's um, they don't think in that mathematical way. It may not be color right. how they're describing it, but they're feeling it. Bingo, hundred yeah. percent. It's yeah. visceral almost. Yeah, they're they're. they're connection with that i would imagine the same thing with you and the canvas that you can your connection with that canvas has got to be visceral maybe not all the time but most of the time it's a the other best way i could describe it it's like being a monk in a monastery when i'm in the studio what you say a monk in it's like yeah it's like being a monk in a monastery it's like uh it, it i have to be alone and and uh like i said it's a spiritual thing like when I'm creating this stuff, mm-hmm. what I'm doing. That's the best analogy to it. So you paint alone. Oh, yeah. No yeah. interruptions. No. Just, I use music a lot. People tell me to turn the music down. It's too loud. <laughs> Never too loud. <laughs> you're too yeah. loud, you're too old. Yeah. That's what they say. Well, I agree. <laughs> All right, so what kind of music are you listening to? Uh, I love uh, like 90s hip hop, uh, Bob Dylan. Oh, right on. Like I love Af- African tribal music, drum music. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, I love just lots of kinds of music, but the stuff that speaks to me is a lot of '90s hip hop and uh, the dr- the drum, the drum stuff. But a lot, some, a lot of, you know, Arcade Fire yeah. and Lumineers and oh yeah, all kinds of stuff. Really, you know. So is is there a direct correlation between that music and what comes out of you, in terms of your your? Mm, I put it this way: I, if there wasn't any music on there, yeah. If you could have two parallel realities, would the painting look the same if done in silence or if done with music? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it would look the same, but the music is a fuel. It's a fuel for okay. me. Okay. It, it it just makes it the experience. Uh, like, I don't always have music on, but 90% of the time I do. It it I, I <laughs> it helps okay. with the process for me. What was the first time that you recognized there could be a monetary component to this venture? Yeah, or to pr- your art in general. Oh, that's a that's another good one. Um, I'm trying, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, "What the hell did I get myself into here?" <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one, man. Let me think about this. One. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> now probably, I guess, out of college, like. Uh, uh, I had a couple shows. I had a big show about Iraq. The Iraq well, talk about war. your first show. Yeah. Your very first show, where was it? Yeah, well... And how did you get there? Who encouraged you mm, to do it? Well, the first thing I did was a street festival. Okay. Right? Uh, uh, in Shadyside. All right. And I got noticed by this guy who had his website, right? That okay. was kind of the start of it. And then okay. there was a gallery, a, a really nice gallery... In, called Bella Art Gallery on, on Ellsworth and Shadyside. Shady Side, yeah. Yep. And they were great people, Ed and Rena Klump, and they uh-huh. actually have a gallery in Virginia now. But they like really, uh, they really promoted me, and I had I had my first like really big official show there about the Iraq War, 
and it like took off that subject blew up you did a series of paintings for that, right? Yeah, I did seven of them. Uh-huh. And, like, you know, the newspapers came running and because it was so topical. Mm-hmm. And we went to Florence. We were in this biennial in Florence, and we all went. They, you know, sponsored me, and my parents went, my friends. It was amazing. Like the seven, eight years ago? Yeah. So this is in 05, 2005. Oh, longer damn. than that. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, but I also did a, I did a show at the Rivers Club downtown, too, about, it's called 20 Portraits. Okay. So I, I just I think I just saw a news article on that. Yeah, yeah, but then the the Iraq show like just took on a life of its own. But it wasn't like portraits; it was topical. Okay. But then you know people were interested in buying the portraits and in in the uh, pieces for the Iraq show and taking them to Florence. You know, we they were for sale. So, right. Yeah. So that was like the start of it, and people were buying them. You know, people. I wasn't just. I was actually selling them. <laughs> you know, you're actually selling your work. You know, that's Did a big that blow your mind initially? Uh, or you're like, no, this is what it should be happening. No, it kind of, I mean, yeah, no. It, it, I knew, like like I said, the whole Penn State thing was what started it. So I knew I had something, a value. It could be a value. And I look back, the work was good. Like at that street festival, I was selling pretty high quality stuff in a tent. Okay, and people were buying it, so that was really the start. You knew something was going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. Yeah. Now, do you, if you reproduced um, any of your work, like like um, what they call gliques? They yeah. call it gliques. Am I G- pronouncing that? Giclé. 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 I'm always mess that up. Right? I mean, did you ever go down that that road, or do you do prints and sign print? I think there's even a thing called enhanced gliques now, where the artist will get the gliques and then put some hand applied paint on there or something. Yeah, you're right. There are. I'm you know, learning things. You know that. Not many <laughs> I, know, people, I know things. You know, that's a G clay over there. Not many people know this. That's man. a G clay over there. That's why I know that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Actually, that's funny you mentioned that. I did this event Sunday, and there's a woman asking me because uh, I had a couple Prince posters and how she, how, what would the price be? And yeah. do I do these? And I've always intended to, but I've never done it. But uh, I had did had some prints made, some posters, so. I, I should do it. I, I should do it, but it's it always gets like, you know, there's always something things else. Things I should yeah, do, right? Yeah, things I should do. <laughs> I should, absolutely, yeah, exactly. So you yeah. are a teacher. Yeah. As well as an artist. Right. Right. Were there ever moments in your career like you said, well, you know, maybe I should turn do a hard turn to art? Did you ever think about doing that? Yeah, I have actually lately been kind of, because th- I think it's established enough. That I possibly could. Okay. Like, but but I always knew like I, I wasn't there yet. I didn't think I was ever there yet. But I'm starting to think I might be. <laughs> yeah. And then now, I was gonna I was gonna have a little cutting comment there and say, well, let me guess, you got that idea during the pandemic, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, the the idea was, uh, yeah, it's coming on a little stronger. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> It was a tough time in education. Yeah, for sure. So um, in regards to the pandemic, like, did you find yourself painting more during that time? Because obviously, I mean, being a teacher during that time had to be probably even more difficult with all the remote learning and everything else going on. It so was. was the painting also more therapy for you? Or uh, was it therapeutic? I, I was able to do, actually, I did a portrait during the pandemic. I was, I was really proud of it. Was, uh, it's in that book. It was an art professor, a professor I had at Penn State who, okay. he was actually art education. His name's Dr. Paul Bowen. He was a very great man. And uh, I was able to, I always said I wanted to do his portrait, him and his wife. So I finally did it during like the lockdown. That's what I worked on. So I utilized the time, I thought, pretty well. So you worked your way through. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I know that the art community and the music community were hit pretty damn hard uh, with the lockdown in general, um, mm-hmm. you know, just in terms of because I was told basically that a lot of artists, you know, they they bank on the opportunity to have a show, or even if it's a street festival, have people come and experience their art live because that's how most of the sales are made. You know, the patrons come because they can. There's a visceral thing going on there, right? Yeah. As opposed to looking at it on a screen. Is that correct? Yeah, it's cr- yeah. I mean, absolutely. I think yeah. Uh, and I think it was worse for musicians just performing, but yeah, to have your work, you know, and have an opening and have people as a social thing. 
Absolutely. You, looking at anything on a screen is not uh, not the same, if you ask me. You know? Okay, so what is what's your thoughts on this AI art, which seems to be going around Instagram and the web right yeah, now? Yeah, I saw some of that. I mean, to me, it's the polar opposite of what I do. Like, I think, uh, like, AI art, I think it's interesting. I think it, like, a lot of the AI stuff has value. It's fascinating, like, in no doubt uh, is going to open up a lot of avenues in the future, but inherently you cannot you cannot uh, replace the true artist, the true art, like, and that's why to me it's spiritual. You can have a computer design something with AI intelligence, but they'll never, they'll never design the David of Michelangelo or nude descending a staircase, or they're never going to write freaking Hamlet. Okay, so it doesn't to me. It doesn't matter. It's never going to get there. I don't know a lot about it. Is the premise that basically the the computers will take you know thousands or millions of of pieces of art and take all their attributes and somehow put that in an algorithm and then you give it a a subject and it just goes and does it yeah. based upon other people's work? Is that pretty much? Because if that's the case, then there's really nothing original with that. It's just the because if every bit of information is being basically being farmed out there and then, yeah. then consolidated into another output. Isn't that really just kind of the combination of everybody else's work? I, you yeah, know? Yeah, it, it, pretty much, I think. I mean, I've seen, like, they've done this stuff with, like, music and... Uh, yeah, I've heard a few things from that, which is sterile. I don't know. Yeah. You could tell it's not... Yeah, I think so. To this point, anyways. Yeah, yeah. Like, they put... I think they did like a Beatles song or something. Like they put all of the Beatles music, they crunched it all, and it it made it a new Beatles song or something, or a Rolling Stones song. I think it was the Beatles, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. But the and it just doesn't sound like it. Somewhat. You, Is that I, the intangible you, about the human experience for the, the arts? Soul. It's yeah, the soul. It's the soul. It's the soul. You can't quantify the soul. We have all this science. Uh, uh, you can't quantify the soul; it will never be quantified. Okay, and and it, that's what I think, and that's where a lot of art comes from. It becomes yeah, because it's kind of mechanical if it's all artificially contrived. Absolutely, right? yeah. And there, like I said, there's a place for computer and AI, but I it will never get to the the most. Complex, complex thing in the universe is the human brain. Mm -hmm. You know, there's things we just don't get, we don't understand. You know, and I don't think you ever understand it. Like the soul, <laughs> you're never gonna understand it. Totally. Now you, you've done a lot of traveling. Um, I'm guessing a lot of traveling in Europe. Is that correct? European countries. I uh, yeah, yeah, Middle East. Uh, yes. Okay, so just speaking strictly from an art standpoint, when you go over there, whether it's for your art or for other reasons at all, do you always make time to, to look at, you know, whether it's a gallery or museum there or, or just maybe what the local art scene is? Yeah, I try. Definitely. Absolutely. I mean, the museums in uh, Spain. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Italy. Just uh, there's so much. Th like, Italy is a museum unto itself. Rome. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, yeah, I try. Abs like, the Israeli Museum in uh, Jerusalem is, like, one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. I just, this, it's amazing stuff. Why do you think the average American does not have a relatively solid understanding or appreciation for art history? Like, what, where, where have we, how are we kind of void of that knowledge as a general public? Or are we? Maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe it's just me. I don't no, know. I, because I think in America, in general, like if you go to Europe, <laughs> This is, a, a, the, I think, the perfect uh, explanation of this. You go to Europe, Italy, Spain, like the roads, the, the, a lot of the streets are named after artists and poets. Think about that. In America, the streets are named after generals and like uh, maybe the mayors and stuff. States people. Uh, yes. Know, statesmen. I mean, I think there's no greater example than that. It's just culturally in America... Art, like in Europe, artists and art is is held with a higher status, and it's more part of their their lives. In America, it's more 
business, money, work. The arts are secondary. They're not really primary. They're they're a, a, a additional bo- uh, additional thing to life. It's very different. So, would you say in America, art has the money component at the at the top? Art it, will exist in in this for the most part. The art will exist in our capitalism if there can be a money component attached to it. Not always, but generally speaking. Whereas over there, art stands on its own. Maybe in the in the European culture. Well, I I think that's a really important conversation, and I I heard. Uh, I think it was one of the guys, uh, Gene Simmons, talking about this, about why are there no, you know, he's saying rock and roll is dead, and you can speak to this more than I can. I'm not a musician. Mm-hmm. But uh, it, rock and roll is dead. Why, where are all the all new bands? There are none because, like, look at the Beatles, their trajectory. Like, they started when they were so young, 15, and, like, they went, it was like a college of music up until, mm-hmm. you know, and they're, it's too, like, almost risky to do that now. Like, you know, kids are like, you better go to college to make a living. If you don't do it, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna be out in the street. You know, there, that's a whole other conversation. Did, did you know? um, so on that subject because <clears throat> I remember the comment Simmons made. The comment "Rock is dead," which got a lot of consternation. But Gene's pretty good at making comments that he knows are going to be <laughs> lightning rods, right? But it opened up a conversation. And, yeah. And the thing is, I, I I think his explanation was from a commercial standpoint technology kind of killed rock and roll as we knew it because when downloading happened no one wanted to pay for the experience of enjoying the music anymore so i think that's where he's kind of coming from i mean who knows no that but, i yeah i think that's part of it but it's also it, it's also what i was saying about the importance of art it's and and is it given is it given like this is really important i mean like thank God there were the Beatles. Like, that was a really good decision to go into the Beatles, you know, on all their parts, right? And look how it affected the world. But that, it's too, like, risky now. Like, everything, like, with 18-year-old kids, you know, you better make this decision. It's such an important decision. So you don't have, like, you just don't have that flex time and that, and you need that for creativity and just having a band for fun and maybe it's going to go somewhere. Like everything is so serious. Good point. It's sad in a way. Good point. You know, I I actually feel bad for these kids in a lot of ways because there's no, like, of this window of freedom. So is, you know? is art being discouraged in the young over other priorities? Over yeah, other... I think so. Absolutely. Yeah. You teach art. You yeah. teach art to what sixth and seventh grade? Yes, six, seven. So eight. what are you seeing? Like, what what do you think? Well, it's 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 interesting to talk to the eighth graders because they're picking their classes for high school, and for many of them, I ask them, uh, "Will you ever take another art class again?" They're like, "No, probably not." Like that's it. There's no room for it. Wow. They have to take academic classes. Yeah, it it takes like a lot of parental support, and it is it is a risk to be an artist, but. It, to me, it's not a choice. You either are or you aren't, and it's a calling. You know, mm-hmm. and nothing. It, I think in any anything like a, vo- like a vocation, a vocation, yeah, yeah. In anything in life, I think you should find your calling, your vocation. I think like everyone has one. Few people find it. Parents you know? are afraid to even suggest that now because they're. Well, I guess they, it isn't just a recent phenomenon. I guess the old thing was, you know, do we don't want the kid to get lost and squander his twenties away trying to find himself? Mm-hmm. The reality is, though, you know, with most people, it will reveal itself. But you got to pay attention to see it, right? You, you, and nobody else can do it for you. You know, that's what I found. Like nobody could ever tell me I was going to be a, a painter. I wouldn't even have believed it myself in high school, you know, but I found it on my own. Nobody can tell you what it's going to be. I tell my students that too, like, you know, your parents mean well, your guidance counselor means well, but you're the only one that can figure that out on your own. And you got to listen to, like Steve Jobs has the great quote, you got to listen to your heart and your your intuition Mm-hmm. And you kind of got to like shut get shut things away to find that. It's hard. It's easy for that to get lost. But I think it's the utmost importance. There, I, I think there's many people in the world in their 40s, 50s, 60s. They're on the wrong path. They got on the wrong. They didn't listen to that. They probably knew it, but they didn't listen to it. You know, it's sad in a way. Didn't think about it. Absolutely. I think it's really sad. You know. Yeah. The the, the whole thing about finding your calling. It's uh, we almost. 
I, I believe that we almost scare kids out of you know taking a serious look at it because we put so much other pressure on them to achieve. Yeah, parents are notorious for doing that, and you know you were talking about your students. It's kind of you, you. You probably have to break down a preconceived notion that there may they might be waiting to be told how to do that, like they're like they're told how to do everything else. And in, in, in art, really, can anyone tell you and, and how? That, that's that's a, to a, do it. That's a such a uh, vital idea you just said, and that's why they say a lot of a lot of the experts. Like there's a guy named Sir Ken Robinson. I recommend everyone watch his TED Talk. It's the most watched TED Talk in history. I think I might have seen that one. You know, and he. He was a big guy for me, but do schools kill creativity? And that you get to the heart of it. Why do schools kill creativity? It's because you're you're always telling students this is the way you do it. They're afraid to take a chance. You know, Thomas Edison took a thousand chances on the light bulb before mm -hmm. he got it. Mm -hmm. We're we're educating people out of their creativity, and it's like it's really scary because that's what we need more than ever in yeah. the world. You know, that probably isn't a new phenomenon, though. I wouldn't think. No, it's not. I don't think it is. But I see it. I really see it. You know, they're, they're telling them what to do all the time, and there's a standardized test. Uh, so they're afraid to get the wrong answer. But with the wrong answer, it's called divergent thinking. Mm -hmm. That's where creativity mm -hmm. comes from. Mm -hmm. That's a whole other discussion. Yeah, for sure. You know? For sure. Yeah. Um, let's just talk about sixth grade art class for a second. So how do you teach art? Like, does art have fundamentals, I'm guessing, right? Like, you know spheres and textures and things i get all of that i guess i kind of get that but like how do you teach art and at what point do you say well this student's got the fundamentals they've they're they've acknowledged them and now i've got to kind of ease off a little bit and see where they yeah. take it that's, yeah. that's got to be a tough call on your behalf too right yeah that's a very interesting conversation but basically what it is is there's different ways to teach art okay and the way i teach it middle school level is Art is more of a therapy than teaching kids how to do it. Art is caught, not taught. Okay? Art is caught, not taught. And then if they're seriously interested and have this talent, then you teach them the fundamentals like in ninth grade, tenth grade. But I, I in the middle school, I don't teach it like that. I teach it as it's a therapy and you just let them have at it. And it's 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 uh it's more it's caught, not taught. Okay. If that makes sense. I think is that saying they have to find find it on their own and then let that expression come out. Well, I, I show them examples. Okay, like I sh I'm not you know it's not just from a total void. I show them examples. Like I do sculpture in sixth grade, so they look through the art history, thousands of examples of sculpture. They reproduce one in clay, and then they design their own and do a clay prototype, and then they, we do sandstone sculpture. So they, they see examples, and they learn some history. Mm -hmm. It's not just coming from a void. But I don't teach, like you're talking about, I don't hammer them with, this is how you draw a circle, a square, a sphere, a shit. You know, I'm not teaching, I'm not giving them that. I'm just letting them, it's just like letting them do it after they look at some the historical context if that makes sense yeah so how do you grade a child in our class how's it's, that work yeah well i mean it's it's mainly on effort if they put forth the effort Got gonna, it. you know i'm not grading them on glad if they, to hear that yeah it's not a grade of uh it's very unusual can, in public school <laughs> yeah you know it is <laughs> with most subjects right yeah yeah it is but i i feel at the middle school level it's the way to do it it's more it's a therapeutic thing for them and they need that and i'm not making this up this goes back to like one of the founding fathers of art education his name was victor lowenfeld mm -hmm. and a guy named sir herbert reed okay and they founded this philosophy after uh, they felt that nazi germany the, the the kids in nazi germany were set up for this dictatorship where they were not allowed to freely express themselves in schools and it it became this like it, it set them up for failure in life. Like the, like a child that's allowed to freely express himself as a child will later be able to navigate things as an adult much better, if that makes sense. Of course. Yeah. It's really interesting stuff. But it started with them in World War II, in England and Germany. So basically you're, what you're saying is there needs to be enough encouragement of pure creativity in that child's life beyond 
the dictate of you learn yes. this, 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 yes. this way, yes. and you formulate this based upon this. Absolutely. And it works against the rigidity of the school day, and they need that. It's a break. Yeah. It's a mental break. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. It's kind of what what gym class was supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They don't have recess, you know, so they got, I mean, they got to have some, something there. I want to ask you more questions about this portrait. Um procedure for you because I th would you not agree that the public generally has a a lot of misconceptions about art and yeah, like, yeah oh, absolutely. I mean like you know absolutely like I think people tend to shy away from going to art galleries because they don't know what they like what they don't like because they probably haven't immersed themselves in enough of it mm -hmm. they're also they might look at something that is with a, with they may have a lot of prestige in a market, but it might not do anything for them. Mm -hmm. But they may be afraid to express their feelings because they don't want to be viewed as being an art novice or whatever. I mean, I was going to art galleries a couple of years ago. Completely, I would see things that were especially in, with modern art, whatever that means. But I would see something that was like renowned. That thing probably sold for a hundred thousand dollars, and I just didn't it didn't do anything yeah. for me. Yeah. So it's very personal, right? Yes. yes. Well, that's that's why I tell my students. I think art. It's not about if it's said to be important. It's not about okay. Well, this is this was an important in music too, like band or piece of art. And it was, it's expensive. It's what speaks to you. I feel what speaks to you. Okay. Okay. Like, and, and I think a problem with the art world is a lot of people are intimidated by is anything goes in the art world now. And like that kind of started with Andy Warhol, mm -hmm. Pittsburgh artist. Mm -hmm. And he was an amazing transformative artist. The guy was, you know. He created pop art, right? Yeah. Whatever that means. And pop art, right? He took everyday objects from the supermarket, Soup, like Coca-Cola soup. Yeah. And made it fine art. He was transformative with music too, with uh, Velvet Underground. Mm -hmm. And I mean, mm -hmm. they, where he did like reality TV before anyone ever did it, right? But he broke the doors open, for better or worse, and it kind of was like anything went. So I think a lot of people they don't get it now because anything goes, and uh, they just don't understand the, like modern art, you know? Because it is, it's a free for all in a lot of ways. So I, I think the modern art is not too difficult for me, but where I struggled was the minimalism movement because it was just like what am i looking at exactly yeah <laughs> you know i mean yeah i hear you i, I hear mean you. if someone sees something in it enough to create it then yeah. there's value there it, well it, it, and a lot of people are like well anybody could do that and it's true uh, anyone probably could do that but it's about the concepts behind this uh -huh. art what are the what what is the uh, jackson pollock drip painting why was that created why because it was created during the atomic age mm -hmm. when there's a lot of you know yep. you got to know what the the, the meaning history, absolutely to a lot of it you know and people don't get that right you know? right, right right instead of just looking at it like you know you look at the mona lisa or the david you it's a uh, amazing works of art but the the conceptual stuff throws people you got to sure. understand the meaning the, the more the more realistic to the to the average person on the street i'm going to guess they're with them not being immersed in the art community or the art world the more realistic something looks to them that's how they would grade which is ridiculous but that's how i think the average person grades things like if they the less they understand it the less value they'll put on it does yeah. that make any sense absolutely yeah yeah is, is that right no, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I, I think for a lot of people, yes. Which is yeah. really sad. Yeah, you know? they're just not educated. I mean, even like <laughs> I talk. I had an art professor in college tell me, you know, she grew up in the '60s and '70s, and when Warhol was doing Brillo boxes yeah. in a gallery, uh -huh. how was that art? She was, and this woman's a brilliant woman. She now she couldn't wrap her head around that, you know, so. And now it's now it's like you know cliche that that kind of thing he was doing. Yeah. Did, did you? What's your thoughts on? And I'm going to pronounce his last name incorrectly, but I'm going to try to get it right. Salvador Dali. Mm -hmm. Is that his pronounce? Yeah. Well, that, so, is it Dali or is it Dali? I think it's Dali. 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 I would say Dali. It's not the. It's not like the woman's name, Eric. Mm -hmm. It's like Dali. I'm like I don't know. What do you think of that? What's he even on your radar? Yeah, he's. 
I, I know of him. He's not one of my favorites, but I think he was an amazing Spanish artist, no doubt. I mean, he was he was doing surrealistic, dreamlike stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he he mm-hmm. really played, you know, a lot of all these artists back then, they really played the uh, the public image well. You know, he, they he became played, celebrities. Yeah. Like Picasso and they, and they was the master. And they loved it. Yes. Yeah. And Dolly, Dolly was very good at it, too. He's very eccentric playing, you know, Strange walking guy. around with an anteater and a mustache. <laughs> he would show up in, like, scuba gear at his openings, and he, he played it very well. You know, I, I don't, and I think it was all, you know, very calculated. But his, some of his artwork's amazing stuff. I mean, no doubt. He was one of the great Spanish masters. Yeah. And the Spanish people love him, I think, you know. Like, I was in a bar in Madrid. I think it was Madrid. It was, it was a dolly bar. It was all his pictures of him. I, I think he, was, he had been to this bar, you know. They love him. Back to color again. I'm not going to let you get off that subject. So when you see somebody, do you? what's the first thing, whether, it's, whether you're going to do a portrait or whether you just happen to see somebody mm-hmm. on the street, mm-hmm. do you get visceral responses from, not everybody probably, because you, your mind would be blown if every single person was giving you some kind yeah. of moment, right? But do you see people in terms of color, auras? What do you? No, it, not really. No, I don't. Like, I mean, maybe I can translate someone's personality into color but i don't i don't see them like that i mean the process is in the studio it's it's with, in, in the, with intent yeah yeah i don't walk around seeing people shape <laughs> colors <laughs> you don't see people not, <laughs> no I, one's coming for yeah him, no i i don't i don't because yeah, uh, i always try to dial down dial down to things and try to understand that that i don't understand and i'm not an artist and so yeah when you see or when you speak with an artist and they say, I see this in this person and that's what per, how I presented that. It's fascinating to me. Like, where does that come from? Because I'm not sharing that same experience. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's not, a, it's not a shared experience. No, no, it's not. But I mean, uh, like, the, like I said, the best way I can describe it is I feel like what I do is a gift. You can't teach it. It's a gift and... I've just like I discovered I had this, mm-hmm. and uh, I feel like it is my purpose. So y- you can't teach what I'm doing. Like y- yeah. I can't teach someone to do this. But I and I I just I think everyone like has a gift, and you got to find it. That mm-hmm. should be like the point of your life. Whatever it, it's it's, it's all over the board. Yeah, it's, it's you advice. know, all over the board. I have no idea. You know what? Uh, so. Talk about reaffirmation, how important that is, if it's important to you at all. Like when you are at a showing and you get positive reaffirmation, whether it's a portrait you're doing specifically for a commission for a client or whether it's just someone buying your work or a, a, a critic of your work. You know, how do you have, you have you ever struggled when you were younger, a younger artist? Did you struggle with bad criticism? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I me- I always remember this story. I did. uh the show I did of portraits, I told you at the Rivers Club, it was one of like a big early on thing for me out of college. I did 20 portraits, I called it. I don't know why, and it was like a brutal task to do these 20 portraits. I don't know why I picked 20. And I did 20, and um, it was a the show was a success. It got a ton of people there. It was a great, like, uh, in terms of just people coming to okay. it, it was great. Okay. Okay. But I, there was this art critic who was at the show. I didn't know him. And it's when you first got a call. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, he he was pretty, you know, well-established guy. I think he wrote for the Post Gazette, and he, you know, he worked for Carnegie Mellon or something. And but he came arts to, critic. What a fascinating yeah. job title. Yeah. Yeah. He was. I don't know his name, but he uh, he came up to me and kind of like angrily said to me. 20 portraits how capitalistic <laughs> really yeah and i always remember that and, and i was like yeah he's right he's actually right you know like yeah but i thought that was that was one that's buzz that stuck me you know, stuck so are you, are you better with criticism now have, have you changed the yeah, way you deal well, with it well like yeah because i know my mission as an artist i know it and people don't get it you know a lot of like I was talking, as a teacher, people know I'm an artist, or they know I have this thing going on outside of school, but most of them don't get it. And like, 
it doesn't phase me anymore because I understand it and know what it is, okay? So people, like, it's abstract. You're an abstract artist, you know? It's like a, it's a derogatory thing, right? It's kind of like mocking it. They're making fun of it. It's not abstract. You could, like, I just laugh at this stuff now, you know, because I know what it is. Uh-huh. If you, if that makes sense, yes, it doesn't. It does. fade. People are always throwing stuff. A label. I, they're, they're trying to fit a label or a narrative yeah. behind the label, right? Yeah, yeah. And like when you get, I'm sure you under, you probably understand this, or you know, you got this thing going on, Eric McKenna Project. Mm-hmm. When you get like some kind of uh, notoriety, mm-hmm. like in the newspapers, mm-hmm. people like want to knock that. You yeah, it, it, it happened by coincidence here. We were recognized by Pittsburgh Magazine. They did a story on us, and all of a sudden, you know, it was like, I don't, yeah, I wasn't doing it for them anyways. My argument was I was doing the show for myself. It was kind of cool that people noticed, but and I, obviously you expect criticism, but it was funny how the criticism was almost like, um, like there was some point I was trying to do. Which I would imagine would be very similar to an artist, right? There's under, so would the interpretation of the critic be wrong because it wasn't done for them? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like it's almost like how can you have a critic who's going to criticize your work or critique your work, but it wasn't created for them specifically? Mm-hmm. So how valid would their critique be? And that's kind of how I weathered it when I got my when they were like, well, I'm not doing the show for them. Yeah, yeah. That was easy for me, but I imagine yeah. it, but art's a little more personal. Yeah, no, that, that's a really interesting uh, a, a topic there. But, yeah, it, yeah. But it, it so it's just, uh, like, I navigate that now by just knowing what my, what my purpose is. And knowing it so much, it doesn't phase me. I know I, I know I have a calling, and I better do this. I don't want to mess it up. I don't know why I have this I calling. That. I don't know why love that. I got this, but mm-hmm. I got it. I better not mess it up. That's how I look at it. Mm-hmm. And I think that if you drill down for a lot of creative people who have success, I think if you drill down with them and you get them to be honest with you, you'll discover exactly what you just said to me. That's at the core. They, I, it's I, I in agree. there. It's got to come out, and they yeah. have to get it out because anything less than that is, is absolutely unbearable. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's for a lot of athletes too. Sure. Like I, I I've heard. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of Wayne Gretzky, and I've heard. Basically, that's what he's kind of said the same. You know, his dad told him, "You got this ability. You better not mess it up." There's a lot of stress pressure not to mess it up, but he didn't mess it up. You know, and I and I think that's. It's true. You, you, <laughs> that that's what you. If you have this something, if you have a gift or something. You should try not to mess it up, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and sometimes messing it up is just not putting it an effort through. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I mean, half, half the ball game is, I mean, and you probably encountered this with, with students, too. It's like how sometimes just the biggest, half the battle is just getting that first brush stroke on the, on the canvas, right? Exactly. Just doing it, preparing, getting ready to be able to do it. Yeah, the, all that. Yeah. Like, you know, the proper steps to being uh-huh. able to do it. Uh-huh. What about, uh, you mentioned sculpture before, so you you work with sculpture as well? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I, I don't, no, not personally as an artist, but I teach sculpture in sixth grade. That just seems so, how, how is that similar to? It It is, like, it like really. The linear nature versus yeah, the 3D? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's a weird thing to think about, but it really, like, I think if you, uh, like, I use oil paint. It's very, it's very thick. Okay, and like when I'm really in the zone of doing it, it's really like sculpting. It's because like because it's got texture too. Yeah, right? the texture, and you're like when you're discovering the work, it's already there. You're just like taking the pieces and moving them or sculpting them away to find it. And it, it like when you're really in the zone of it, it's it's more like sculpture than painting. Believe it or not, <laughs> like it's even like um, if you if you have a blank canvas and you're starting, let's say, a commission. Yeah. At the moment that you're getting ready to put ink on that, I'm excuse me, uh, foils, you paint with oils. Yes. Okay, oils on that canvas. How do you determine the first color? 
or is this something you don't even think about? It just comes out of you. It, it's or is there a cognitive process yeah, where you're determining it? No, that's that's also a great question. It's it's a different way of thinking. Like, and it's to me, like I said a million times, it's a spiritual thing. It's intuitive. Like when I get into the studio, I shut the door, and it's like a med. I'm like meditating. You know, I, I I'm I'm alone and. It just it comes to me like what the first step is, but the first step, like I people I, I had a photographer kind of do a time lapse of it, like some stuff I did, and the first step is so far removed from where it's going to end up, but you got to start somewhere. Uh, but it, it's just it's intuitive, like it it just I, I feel it, like this is where I start. I got and I just jump on. I've learned just to jump onto it. Instead of, you know, I don't think about it for days. I just jump, it's like jumping in a pool and going, swink or swim. Have you ever gotten deep into a commission or to a, 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 to a painting and all of a sudden just this garbage, this is not right and, and tossed it? I mean, have you ever gotten that far? This is not right. I, I'm not lately. Like, I feel like I'm hitting home runs. I know and I'm totally doing that. But I do, I do, like, I'll, I'll change direction with something, you know, like it, it will go and I'll completely, you know, paint over a part and that's wrong. You know, this is not the right way to be going. So I'll do that. But I'll, I won't like stop and start totally over. No, okay. I, I, I'm pretty, okay. I feel like I'm pretty uh, good at what I'm doing now. So I don't. So, yeah. so basically every, every piece is different naturally, but the process you've gotten much more skilled in your own process yeah i'm, I'm totally confident in it and there's the decision making process in there as well too so yeah. you did some rather big pieces too from when i was looking back yeah. on, on your work too how do you determine yeah. generally like if you're going to do a series do you determine like that they're all going to be the same size like how do you proportionally how do you determine where you're going to start yeah i like i just like to work big like these portraits it's it's you know the the smallest portrait I'm really doing is four foot by four foot, and that's big to most people. Oh yeah, very big. Oh hell yeah, hell yeah. But uh, I I like to work big. I just like to work big, you know. And uh, I don't know the, the the Iraq paintings I did were really six feet by six feet. They're they're really big, and I don't know. I just I like to work that size, you know. As a as a member of the art appreciation public, I will tell you it's easier to immerse yourself in something if the scale's bigger yeah yeah for me yeah yeah you know i would think because i've gone i've seen i've gone into art galleries and seen pieces that are like you know a quarter of this you yeah. know this elaborate frame around it and there's this little piece in the middle <laughs> and you're you know it's, it's just harder visually to yeah. immerse yourself in it yeah no doubt yeah i i think that's it i just like the immersion of the the size and but the the portraits i just I think they're better, bigger, because there's more room to work. Just works, symbolism. It just works better that yeah. way. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I would like them all to be. Four foot by four foot is like the minimum, you know. And Damn. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I've done smaller pieces. I just don't think they're that, they're the quality's there. It's just not enough room to work. Not enough room it's to, like str a fight. to stretch out. <laughs> yeah. It's a fight to get a lot of clients, they don't want it that big you know they don't have room in their house i gotta uh -huh. fight for it okay <laughs> no i want uh, that wall <laughs> yeah I want, yeah exactly i want that space yeah you took you're saying the portrait uh it takes roughly it was three months six months uh, about four months four months for a portrait yeah yeah that process is really interesting to me not being an artist to see how you immerse yourself to 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 yeah. see I mean I, I've had I've had some portrait stuff done over the years too and the artists would get a, a good feeling for what I was about and the, and you know I get it but I don't get it because I can't do it mm -hmm. <laughs> it's such a specialized skill man mm -hmm. yeah I um I, I I will say that the the most amazing thing to me with all of you that are in the arts this way is that it does go back to it's just in you and you have to have the talent to bring it out and i think in the in visual arts it's way m more difficult to me than music uh, the other aspects of the arts when it comes to visual arts to get that 
that's in here and in here on that canvas yeah or even on that that 3d sculpture yeah the average person michael just can't wrap their heads around that yeah no i i i know and it to, you know it's like it just it just like would flow out of me it's just second nature it's like in my being you know uh-huh. and it's just i don't think it's it's the effort to bring like I, I try to tell this to students a lot, you know, like I think you know, part of the journey of your life is like discovering what is in you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is in you? Right. What is in your soul? You got to like find it. It's mm-hmm. a search in a lot of ways. Uh, people, people go through their whole life and never know they have a talent for a long time. They never discovered it. They never did. They never tried something, and then they discover they have this immense thing within them, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think you know, kids should just try everything. You just don't know. You you don't know what's in you, you know. So it's it's kind of a that's a big big uh, thing for me is like people. I, it blows my mind. People have these these abilities or talents. They don't know it, <laughs> you know. What it's about sad. the what's the Pittsburgh art community? Like what's what's your thoughts on it? You've done all the traveling you've done. Um, yeah. What's your what's your how? You know we get accused of being a lot. We we accuse it of being nothing but a stealer town basically when mm-hmm. it comes to all kinds of things. There's probably a little validity in that. Mm-hmm. How are Yinzers in regards to um, their support of art in this town? I th- well, I mean, I think that you know, there's a book out there, Paris of Appalachia, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh does have like all these amazing like there's a Carnegie International going on right now mm-hmm. that most Pittsburghers don't know about. Right. It's one of the biggest art shows in the world. It mm-hmm. started here. It's going on right now again, you know. I think Pittsburgh's come a long way from uh, it's it, it it's it's a great sports town, but I think there's a whole other component that and people are starting to realize that or they've already realized it. 10 years ago you know there was the, it's Pittsburgh's in a in a location in the United States where it's close to New York Philadelphia Washington DC a drive right and then there was this uh, low cost of living comparatively so you had like this restaurant uh, a renaissance that happened what 10 15 years ago mm-hmm. because there's room to experiment yes I think I think there's a lot of talent in Pittsburgh but and I've talked to uh a friend of mine, she's a jazz singer, Jessica Lee. Mm-hmm. It's like the confidence factor. People have an, they don't, Pittsburgh has like an insecure, uh, an inadequacy complex or something. Okay. I think a lot of, a okay. lot of, you know, like you can't be a great artist and be from, be out of Pittsburgh. You got to be in New York or LA. I think that's changing. Okay. And, and you know, that book, uh, The World is Flat, I, mm-hmm. I think things have really changed along all those ways. But I think there's a there's a lot of talent in Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. But it's uh, having the confidence and the inferiority complex that exists, I feel, in I Pittsburgh. I can see that. That's what I think. I can see that. But there's, like, there's tons of stuff. Uh, the cultural institutions are, like, bar none here. Mm-hmm. So I think it's, I think the institutions are here, but we've struggled at, at times for the the public to partake in them. You know yeah. what I mean? It isn't yeah. for lack of the opportunity. I think yeah. it's just yeah. No, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And I, I, don't, I don't know how to solve that. I mean, I don't know. I don't have an idea on how to solve that. I think it's a generational thing, and I I think uh, I think we're going in the right direction, though. Okay. Yeah. I think Pittsburgh's going in the right direction. I hope so. I think uh, I, I really think there's a there's a ton of talented people here. Uh, there, I I really do. I I see it. You know. And so, people that create are they? Is the ter- appropriate term makers? Is that is does the term makers apply to artists? Am I getting that right? Uh. Or is it you too can, widely you, encompassing? I mean, you could say that. You could apply that term. I uh, first, off, I, I do want to say, I think, I think there, it's rare you find a true artist. It's like 
the being an artist is the highest compliment and you can apply it to a lot of fields but uh, in the visual arts fundamentally it's there there's a lot of uh there's a lot of people that do art okay mm -hmm. i think the term artist is thrown around generically all the time just because you're uh painting or drawing doesn't make you an artist mm -hmm. okay that's very rare mm -hmm. you know even the highest most some of the most successful painters they don't want to be called like there's a guy named uh wayne Thibault. Thibault i always mispronounce his name he did a lot of cakes and pies he's like kind of a pop artist and he passed away a couple years ago and he was really successful he was in la okay, okay. very successful guy right. museums and the uh, interviewer to ask them you know uh do you consider yourself an artist? And mm -hmm. he said, this guy, of anyone, should have said yes. <laughs> but he, he said no. He said, I'm not an artist. You know, like, it's like uh, Wayne like, Thibault as yeah. artist. He said, the reporter's like, you know, are, you're, are you an artist? He's like, no. I was like, the artist is the highest compliment. It's like a, I think he said, a priest being called a saint or the pope. It, it's very uncommon to be an artist, a true artist. There's many practitioners, mm -hmm. but they're not artists. You know, that that's a generic term that's thrown around. It shouldn't be generic. Well, what's that the, sense? Well, yeah, but what's yeah. the delineation? Like if someone was to say to you, you know, okay, so what yeah. determines is an artist and what is yeah. not? That's a hard question. Yeah. it's. I think it's taking something and totally making it your own, like making forging a new path like picasso was definitely an artist he forged many different paths on his own basically you know uh, van gogh was an artist right but you know like uh it's debatable it's a debatable thing i don't think it's it's black and white thing like norman rockwell was he a great artist some people would say yes some people were like no he was a graphic designer who did these you know it's debatable subject. Could, could, but let me ask you this. Could a photographer be an artist? I think so. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. But so it's, it's rare. It's rare. I feel it's totally... It's like musicians. Like, you know, like how many of them are true artists? I, I don't, you know, if that makes that's, sense. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a, It's interesting how those mediums overlap in terms of the valuations. Like for me... Like when I look at Ansel Adams, who did this black and white landscapes in the photography realm, that was art to me, because it really has never been duplicated. I I think she it was a she or he. Or I don't know. I don't know. I thought it was a man. Maybe it's yeah, not. Yeah, I think. But they, were, they been, were an artist. But yeah. that hasn't been duplicated. No. So no. But if you get you know, yeah. And I know some fantastic, world-renowned George Lang lives in Pittsburgh. One of the most wonderful and well-renowned American photographers probably in the last 50 years and you know and he and when you get your picture taken by George and you look at the output there's something there that wonderful local photographers that are great the output's different like there's just something intangible so I look at George's work yeah. as he's an artist with that camera absolutely and he and yeah. he'll use a Canon for one shot and then he'll use a rangefinder Leica yeah. for another shot it's not the camera yeah it's the composition and the it's output something it's something you can't quantify like an intangible an intangible essence yeah I think that's absolutely true yeah there's there's a many people out there that call themselves artists, but they're really not. <laughs> they they haven't achieved that level. You know, it's yeah. it's just it's just a generic term people use. You know, but it really shouldn't be. Yeah, but it, and it, but it gets back to that whole thing like who determines? You know what I mean? Like who determines? Yeah. And what's the benchmark? Yeah, there I. You know. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. It's a really cool question to ponder, though. Yeah. And, I, and I've tried to, you know, I don't like to give George all these compliments because he hates it when I do that. But, but yeah. you know, here's a, he's a reason why he's George Lang and there's a reason why he's yeah. shot all these amazing covers for every, yes. for, I mean, he shot yes. every movie star there is, world leaders, right? Yeah. There's a reason why he gets called because that output yeah. has some kind of intangible yeah. thing. It's like right? Steven Spielberg. Like, what makes him... There's something that makes his movies like. I, I'm not a movie guy. I mean, I love movies. 100. percent You know, there's something though that, that goes beyond it. It's got to be. There's something to it. Bob Dylan. There's something to his craftsmanship as a song, than other guys. 
what is it? Where's the line? I don't know. And you can't describe it. You can't that. define yeah. it, kind of. The yeah. ultimately, and that's where I, yeah. I, I get back to like just the concept of a critic, you know, music critics, and I can't even begin there with an art critic. I wouldn't even know where to begin to try to invalidate that bullshit. But yeah, even music critics, if it's someone like, really, someone's going to tell me, someone who works for the Pittsburgh Press used to tell me if it's a good album or not. And I should buy it or shouldn't buy it. Yeah. Really? How's yeah. that possible? <laughs> but they're getting paid. That's they're on a, staff. They're writing yeah. about stuff. I get it. Or like yeah. they go to a concert. Now, concert reviews are one thing. So if someone wanted to come to one of your shows and review your work, yeah. that's different, right, than being a critic of the work. Right. Is that right? Yeah. 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 I would say. I mean, like, well, the review, you know, there's, there's reviews. There's different types of reviews. But a, a critic could come to the show and, and give their opinion and 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 that's what they do they're critics right or they review just uh objectively they're reviewing what is there you know they the critic is subjective but there's different reviews but it's similar to reviewing an album they give their opinion or rate it you know it's a similar thing it can be it's it's just it's just whether they're documenting it or reviewing it, you know? I, I yeah. love the fact, especially with artists who, music's one thing, it's close, but an artist, the courage it takes to do that and put that out for public review yeah, it's, is just... It's whether, brutal. It's not, it, it, it takes a lot of balls. It's brutal, man. <laughs> it just does. It that. does. And, that, and that puts you folks in my little hemisphere as being like on a different level because mm -hmm. it takes courage along with... I mean, wouldn't yeah. you say the first time someone paints, to yeah. get that ink, I say ink, to get that oil on yeah. that canvas, yeah. it's courage. Yeah, no, it, it it's, uh, you gotta, it is, it is. to put. Well, it's like the, what is it, Teddy Roosevelt quote, the critic and the person in the arena. I want to be in the arena, you know, that's me, but, and, but it's not easy. It's not easy, and you're going to take some bruisings, and people don't get it, and they're going to, you know... And if you do get success, it's the the tall poppy syndrome. You ever hear that mm -hmm. from Australia? They want to cut you down to equal you out to the rest of the poppies, man. Uh -huh. That's exactly <laughs> it's right. It's never ending. Like it's, it's oh, never. That's you know? exactly right. Yeah. I don't know. It's to me. It's it's uh, it's fun. It's a fun thing. Did you have a good time, buddy? I did. I I could go on and on. Oh, you we're got, gonna do. We're gonna you do. Got this me going. <laughs> we're gonna do this way yeah. more than the tonight. That's yeah. for sure. I, yeah. I I've been looking forward to this one immensely. Yeah. Uh, our mutual friend told me that the conversation was gonna be um, be amazing, and it has been. And how can folks reach you? The easiest way. Uh, I have a uh, the website. My yep. last name it's Fratangelo dot com. Mm -hmm. Frat Angelo. If you Google me, Michael Fratangelo, I'm out there. You can't find him. You're not looking. <laughs> Just Google my name. And, uh, now, I noticed that on yeah. the website, there was not any current works there. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. I chose not to do that on purpose. but uh, So I, I do portraits, and they're shipped off. And a lot of clients don't want them really out there. I understand. But, uh, yeah, it's, that's true. I don't have any work on. It's all, like, reviews and stuff. But That's very cool. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah. Now, do you also have an Instagram page as well? I do, yeah. I have Instagram. That's, that's, yeah, Instagram yeah. almost seems like it's set up for artists. It, it really is. Yeah. Yeah. And Facebook as well, too. I have a Facebook and if you Instagram. Can't, if you can't find them, you're not looking. Yeah. But, again, thank you, my friend. We're going to do this again. I, I, I will love it. All right, buddy. All right. Thank you. All right, friends. We are out. <laughs>